Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Sheshank, an associate professor at the University of Denver. He's gonna be speaking about invariants of torus links in characters of the OAs. Sheshank, take it away. Thank you, uh, assistant professor Floor, who's just joined CU Boulder. So congratulations for that. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the title of my talk, which is Invariance of Torus Links and Characters of VOAs. But I guess as, as you know, I'm not at all a topologist. So um, there are three things which follow as a consequence of that statement. One is that this talk could be a little bit shorter than this seminar time because I, I might just not have a whole lot to say about things. But secondly, and more importantly, uh, sometimes I may inadvertently end up giving wrong references, and please correct me if, if that happens. And third, um, there is a lot of work uh, about connecting, I, I don't know, topological information with characters of VOAs, and uh, definitely papers of Gukov and his collaborators come to mind. But I almost, I know almost nothing about that story. So if someone at the end knows that better and wants to make any comments about that, I would I would be thrilled to learn how that might connect to this. Uh, so secondly, at some point, I mean, also it turns out that, so I said, I'm not a topologist. Okay, so then you would expect that at least I know something about VOAs, but the VOAs that show up in this talk, again, I'm not too big of an expert on those VOAs, but anyway, we'll see how how things go. All right. Um, so what's the aim? Why did I, why am I talking about these things? So almost always the aim for me is, um, is to find and prove uh, Rogers Ramanujan type identities. So what are these identities? They are just plain and simple Q series identities. So on the left, you have a sum I'll explain to you what these symbols are. This is this is called a Pokhammer symbol uh, on the left. And on the right, what you have is an infinite periodic product. And um, typically this first identity is called the second Rogers Ramanujan identity. And the second identity is called the first Rogers Ramanujan identity. But as, as you will see from North theory, you see the, the identity that's on the first line here and not the other one. Uh, but anyway, you see how, uh, how succinct and nice these identities are. And on the sum side, there is a very little difference in what uh, how the sums look like. And on the product side also, there's very little difference. It's just I'm replacing one and four with two and three. Um, anyway, if, you, if, you're, if you're seeing these for the first time, don't let the simplicity uh, fool you. The, I mean, the proofs of these identities are elementary, but None of them are really simple. Um, so here is this notation that I was talking about. This Pokhammer symbol here, Qn is, uh, well, you can have this more generally as uh, if you have two parameters, A and Q, then sub N, you just take this product involving N factors. So it's sort of like a Q deformation of a factorial. And uh, here you see a bunch of these A's and then A base Q to the five, so that's just a compression of these not of this notation where I have to multiply sometimes a few poke hammers together. Okay, so as I said, don't let the apparent simplicity of these identities fool you. There are really um, very interesting things about these identities. For example, uh, you see these products here, and if you just use some theta function identities or so on, you can immediately prove that these products are modular invariant, okay? But here is an open question. Without using the equality of these sums with these products, so forget that you know that Rogers Ramanujan identities are true. I just give you these sums and prove a priori, just, just using these sums, that these sums are also modular invariant. And no one's been able to do that yet. Okay, And that relates to various things like Nam's conjecture and so on. Of course, if you if I tell you that the sums equal products, then of course the sums have to be modular invariant, but how to do that without the products? Anyway, so that's just one amongst many of the deep facts about Rogers-Ramanujan identities. 
And another fact is if you see the presence of these identities in whatever area of mathematics you're learning, then invariably the rabbit hole runs deep and there is there are more identities and more structures that these identities point towards. So seeing the presence of these identities is a good indication that there is a very rich story to be developed. All right, so usually there is some central object whose analysis in two different ways gives rise to the two sides of these identities. So as an example, uh, typically you take a character of some module of an affine Lie algebra or in more generally a VOA, and you evaluate this character in two different ways. So for example, if you build a combinatorial or a quasi-particle basis for, for this module, then you end up getting what is called a sum side. What, what is the sum side or what is usually also called the fermionic side? Uh, it's called fermionic, I guess, because these quasi-particles have some exclusion statistics like the fermions. And if you evaluate this character in a completely different way, typically using character formulas or resolutions, then you get what is called the bosonic side, or in many cases that actually is a nice product, but typically it, it, it ends up being some sort of a, I don't know, alternating sum because you are using resolutions and so on. So you evaluate these in two different ways and you get these two sides of each identity. So that's why they exhibit very different phenomena. And about 45 years ago, Lepowski and Wilson did exactly this. They looked at level three standard modules for SL2 hat and they proved Rogers Ramanujan identities completely using representation theory. And people in this seminar should really think of this as a very important moment in history for us because in their proof, they were the first ones to discover on the mathematical side, the presence of vertex operators. They didn't yet have the vertex operator algebras, which are algebras of these operators, but on the mathematical side, they independently discovered vertex operators and their aim was to prove Rogers Ramanujan identities. Of course, vertex operator algebras existed in physics literature, but um, these guys were the first ones in, in the math world. Okay, so what is this talk about? Well, here, my point is, one should look at, I mean, this is not my point, but this has been known that you can do the same story where the central object is a colored invariant of, of a link. And for this talk, I'll take just torus links. So you can analyze these invariants in two different ways and still get the two different sides of the Rogers Ramanujan identity, the second Rogers Ramanujan identity. Okay. However, at this stage, I'm the things I'm going to show you. I'm not yet at the stage of deducing Rogers Ramanujan type identities, but I'll show you how you at least get the bosonic forms of characters of various VOAs. Okay, so that's this, what's this talk about? Okay. Um, all right, so let me tell you an example. So let's take the torus knot 2, 5. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a moment and color it, color this knot with a reducible SL2 module, the finite dimensional one of highest weight N lambda one, okay? So attached to this data, you have an invariant, which is the colored Jones invariant, or I guess it's also called Resherik into Rive invariant, <clears throat> right? Um, and, uh, just for convenience, this is not serious, but I'll take this invariant to be unnormalized, which means that if you instead took the unknot, then the NS invariant is just the quantum dimension of this of this SL2 module. And uh, I'll also take this J to be framing dependent. So which means that really what's happening is that there is a quantum group behind the scenes and you're talking about the ribbon categories or the modules of that quantum group. And when you're talking about ribbons, you're actually talking about framing. But again, this is not serious. You can easily, if you want framing independent, it's very easily corrected and it doesn't really make a huge difference. So framing dependence in this case means you fix 
the right of this not to be something and I'll take it to be 10. Okay. All right, so with this data, you have this sequence of invariants, J, K, N. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's this knot. So you have, you essentially have two knot, two strands and you twist them once, uh, rather you twist them five times. So one, two, three, four, five. But just to have the correct ride, you also introduce some, I think they are called nugatory loops so that you have the correct framing of this knot. But that's what this knot is. And more generally, if you have torus knot MP, then you take M strands and you twist them five times and you close it up. Uh, not five times, P times, so it's MP. Anyway, yeah. all right. So you do this and uh, you have the sequence of invariants, J, K, N. So fix the knot K, but move this N, which is the weight. And you will see that if you take this limit, so you take, um, the highest weights to be even, then the limit exists for this sequence of invariants. And up to a small factor, which is really an artifact of SL2, it is exactly the numerator in the second Rogers Ramanujan identity, which I wrote on the first line. Okay. Okay. And if you just took the limit along the odd, um, uh, odd multiple of lambda one, you essentially get the same limit, but just with a minus sign. Okay. So if you instead, um, so there is another process that topologists usually do. They, what they do is they divide the Jones polynomial by its trailing monomial so that all of them start as one plus dot, dot, dot. So if you actually did that, then you will get the exact same limits in these two cases. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is, I'm attributing this theorem to Morton. It's a 1995 paper of Morton, but you would not see this exact, the theorem in this exact way, in this exact form, anywhere in his paper. So I'll tell you what you see in his paper and how to get this theorem. Anyway, um, yeah. one important thing is that you do really get the bosonic form out of Morton's theorem. And you should always think that in Rogers Ramanujan identities, the mechanism by which you get the product and the sum form are completely different. So if you are doing it in one particular way, you should only expect to get one particular side of the identities. And here it's it's bosonic form that pops out. Um, in general, if you change this knot, well, then the limits may not even exist. But if the limits exist, they could be very different along these even and odd. And this even and odd has to really do, I think. Um, it, it is related, in at least in the examples I know, it's related to the fact that the index of the root lattice and the weight lattice, I mean, it, that group is just Z, okay? Now, if you actually read uh, papers uh, from topologists that, that do these things, then uh, they're not just satisfied with the limits. There are some very strong stability conditions on, I mean, uh, you can ask, okay, this, right-hand side is the limit of this. So how many terms, so if I'm looking at JK2N, how many terms of this limit actually match that Jones polynomial? And there are very strong um, stability conditions based on that. So the story is much deeper than just limits. There are some strong limits that you will see in, in, in the topology papers, but I'm not concerned with that at the moment. Okay, so that's products. Then how do you get sums? Well, I won't talk a whole lot about that, but there is a paper of Armand and Dasbach who calculated the same invariance in a very different way, essentially using explicit calculations with R matrices, I believe. And they found the sum side evaluations of these invariants and effectively they established this identity then. Okay. And this torus not T25 was not an isolated example for them. So they more generally did this with torus knots T2 comma odd. And so you get an infinite family of identities. And that's the, for people who know, that's the Andrews Gordon identities, where instead of this mod five product, you get in general an odd modulus product. And the modulus in this case is the same as this, this uh, parameter 2k plus one. Okay. And I should mention that to get a knot, so by knot, I mean a link with one component, 
these two parameters have to be co-prime. So that's why I'm taking two and odd. Something very interesting happens if you take two and even, which I'll talk about later. Okay, so is it good so far? What I'm doing and, okay, thank you. Okay, so what's the program then? Well, take your favorite link. Let's take G to be a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra. Let's take lambda to be a dominant integral weight. Let's have this to be the corresponding irreducible highest weight module with that weight. And consider the sequence of these invariants. So you're fixing your knot, you're fixing your lambda, but you're taking multiples of that lambda and you have this sequence, right? Or it is also important sometimes to consider the shifted invariants where I'll denote it by J hat, which are obtained by just take this invariant and divide by its trailing monomial so that it starts as one plus, okay? Okay, so the question is then, does this sequence of invariants or, or the shifted invariants, does it have a limit as n goes to infinity? If it does have a limit, what is it? Can you calculate it? Can you relate it to something known um, and so on, right? Okay, so that's the general um, program. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm not a topologist. So this, there is some, I just want to mention some papers which are sort of important and I'm pretty sure I'm missing some others. So here is one paper of Garu Faledis and Le, where for SL2, they showed that such limits exist and they didn't just stop at showing that these limits exist. They um, they actually showed the strong stability. Um, I mean, there is much more than just limits existing. There is also some strong stability there. So they showed that all these nice things happen for alternating links, and they showed how to calculate these limits also. Okay, so beyond SL2, uh, there is a paper of Garu Falides and and his student, who I believe has stopped being a mathematician and who is working in finance now. And they show the existence of limits for torus knots colored with any weight you want for rank two Lie algebras, okay? <clears throat> um, and I guess they are working with the shifted invariants, not just the J, but the J hats. Uh, also, there are papers by Yuasa where he's showing existence of limits for a large class of links colored with Irreducible SL3 modules of highest weight n lambda one. Okay. So this highest weight is also sometimes known as uh, one line partition or something. Uh, I mean, there is a correspondence between highest weights and partitions for SLN. And this is what corresponds to one line partitions. Okay. And Yuasa also uh, did some very nice work. Uh, and he, he actually did find, uh, he did the work of finding these. Uh, invariance in two different ways for some class of knots, and he deduced some nice identities also. Um, okay, so that's that's what it is. All right, so where did characters of VOAs come in? I have not spoken about that at all yet. So um, let me show you now Morton's formula for SL2 colored invariance for the torus knots P, M, P. And of course, for knots, I need M and P to be co-prime. So this is literally what I've copied from his paper. And that's the formula, right? Now, I don't know how much you have stared at character formulas for Virasorova algebras, but if you just allow me to let this R go from minus infinity to infinity, going along integers, not half integers. And if you put S equal to some power of Q, you would see that this is exactly the character of Virasoro MP up to some Q infinity factor. Right? That's just brilliant, right? I mean, you are looking at torus not MP, you look at SL2 invariance, and immediately you see right in front of your eyes, this is a finitization of the Virasoro character. So if you just carefully match it with the character of Virasoro, you indeed see that, as I said, you take R going from minus infinity to infinity along integers, then that literally is the character. Okay, so just a few notes are that here in Morton's case, K stands for the dimension of the irreducible, SL2 irreducible. I guess I'm 
parameterizing it by the highest weight. So the translation is that here the highest weight is k minus one alpha over two, okay? Um, and S, you have to put Q to the half to match it with the Virasoro. Okay, so <clears throat> what are more features of this summation? Well, really what is happening is that this summation is over the weights of this module, okay? And there are two terms you see, there is plus and minus, so there is also a summation over a while group of SL2, okay? So there are weights of this module and there is Y group of SL2. And you will see that this is, this very nicely generalizes to SLR. If everything that I'm saying is correct. Okay, so what's the hope? So you take a torus knot, you look at SLR colored invariants appropriately. I don't know how to color them, but th this is just a hope that you look at it correctly and then out comes character of the principle of, I mean, the, the principal W algebra for SLR, right? Virasoro is the, uh, I guess, the principal W algebra for SL2. And similarly, you should get principal W algebra for SLR up to some Q infinity factors. Okay. So the point is to realize this hope. So for that, um, what you do is you try to see, I mean, the point is Morton's Arguments just straightforwardly generalized to SLR. That's the crux of the story. Yeah. I have a question, Shashank. So you're saying the simple, the simple W algebra? Simple. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The simple. Yes. Gotcha. This is the Thanks. simple principle, the rational VOA. Thanks. Yeah. Rational C2 cofinite, everything. Simple. Yes. Okay, so Martin deduces his uh, formulas by Rosso Jones formula. So that's exactly what I'm going to use. And so let me just tell you what this is. So let's uh, have the setup, which I've sort of told you, but let's recap it. So just for convenience, I'll consider unnormalized, meaning at the unknot, you get the quantum dimension of the module as the invariant and framing dependent invariants. I'll first talk about torus knots. And I'll fix, because it's framing deep end and you have to fix the framing correctly, but it's fine at the moment. And I'll stick completely to SLR and I'll take these modules and I'll just denote also that I'm working with SLR with a small r here, okay? You'll see why that is a little bit helpful later. Okay, so what are the ingredients in the Rosso Jones formula? First, there are plethysm multiplicities. So, you look at the character of this SLR module, the full character, it's a sure polynomial. So it involves variables like X1 up to XR, which multiply to one. And what you do is, remember our naught was P, P prime. So you take the P in that and you raise all of these guys to P, right? Now you're taking a symmetric polynomial and raising all the variables to PS power. You're still gonna get a new symmetric polynomial. So you re-express that in terms of your sure polynomials and you will get these multiplicity coefficients, right? And they depend on what you started with. So that's the lambda. They depend on which power you took, P, and then whatever sums you get, that's, that's mu. So the sums will be over dominant integral weights. Okay, uh, and for a fixed lambda and P, only finitely many of these multiplicities are non-zero because I'm expressing a uh, symmetric polynomial in terms of sure polynomials, and they're also integers. Okay, so that's the first ingredient I need. The second ingredient is the quantum dimension, which is just this product. If you use, uh, I mean, this is fairly easy to deduce. It's just the uh, Schur polynomial uh, specialized at, at some values. Okay, <clears throat> so this is just a nice product over the positive roots. And uh, yeah, uh, nothing much more to say about that. Uh, and the last is the ribbon twist. So uh, without the half, this here, so delta is the wild vector, by the way. So without the half, what you see here is, is how the Casimir acts on your module. And this is the ribbon twist, okay? On um, acting on the module with highest weight mu. All right. Now I'm talking about knots here, but if you wanted to go to torus links where P and P prime have a non-trivial GCD, then you also need tensor product multiplicities in addition to plethysm, but we'll come back to that later. 
All right, so what is this Rosso-Jones formula? Now, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm also not a quantum group person. So I'm gonna show you a formula, but you won't see that exactly in this way in, in the paper of Rosso and Jones. I'm taking the description of this formula given by Morton in his 1995 paper, but he doesn't show how to go from what's in Rosso Jones paper to this version of the formula. And really there is a much later paper of Xiao Song Lin and Hao Cheng who, who really explain how this formula comes about. So here you see, um, Right, what, what you see is <clears throat> you look at the plesism multiplicities coming from this module that you're coloring it by, and it spits out a bunch of irreducible modules given by mu, and you weigh each of these irreducible modules by the quantum dimension and a certain power of the ribbon twist. And that power is given by what your knot is. Okay, so fairly simple. Um, so this formula works in this way only for torus links or knots, I guess. So if you give me a random knot, which is something other than this, then you would have to re-deduce all of this and put it in some form to, you know, to do the analysis. And the point is that once you use this formula, it stops being a knot theory problem. It's just a completely combinatorial problem, right? Or I guess a representation theoretic problem. Okay, so now let me tell you how we go to principal W algebras. So the key is you color it with N lambda one, okay? Uh, so let's denote the set of weights of this module by pi N lambda one. And an interesting fact, which I don't know if you know, is that for this module, each weight has multiplicity exactly one, okay? For all SLR, if you look at this module, then that's what it is. And this module, this reducible module is, is the nth symmetric power of the, of the defining representation of SLR. Okay. Yeah. So let W be the while group. And you literally step by step, you generalize Morton's argument. And I, I shouldn't even call it my theorem because it really, it's, it's Morton's arguments that generalize. And you see this very nice, expression. So again, this straightforwardly generalizes what I told you for SL2, because you see again here, there is a sum over the weights of this module, right? There is sum over while group. You see a small factor outside, which just depends on SLR. It's effectively the denominator of SLR. And then you have this sum over, I don't know, this is a quadratic form, right? And anyway, right? Okay, so that's good. Now, all that you need to do to get to principal W algebras is replace this, this here, by the entire set of roots. That's it. So as I said in SL2 case, if you had allowed me to make that sum over all integers, which is effectively over all the root lattice, then, then you're done. And that's what you do here. So, some easy facts is that if you take the set of weights of this module, then they sit inside the set of weights of this module, okay? So here R is coming from SLR. And if you just keep expanding this highest weight, then eventually you fill up some coset of, of the root lattice. And which coset is it? Well, it depends on what these guys are, modulo R. So it's J modulo R, so you just take J lambda one. So here is a picture for SL3. So the innermost triangle is the set of weights for lambda one, which is the defining representation. Then you go to four lambda one, then you get this bigger triangle and you have the smaller triangle inside. Give me one second, I need to close my window. No problem. Yeah, they're cutting the grass outside. <laughs> and uh, if you take, even a bigger weight, seven lambda one, then you get this bigger triangle of weights. And you can see if you keep it bigger and bigger, then eventually you're gonna fill up the lambda one coset of Q, yeah? And so that, that really is the argument that if you now take the limit along the ends that are J mod R, then you can effectively replace this with just this sum. 
Okay, and then if you take j to be um, zero, which means that you're taking limit along those guys that are divisible by r, then you get to replace this with just q, and then that this here is just the character of the WR algebra up to some Q infinity factors, uh, which I have written here, okay? And if you want to know this uh, way of writing the character of WR, then it's given in a paper. It's given in many papers, but the one I'm used to is a paper by Foda and Welch. It's a combinatorics paper, but, but it's a combinatorics of WR algebra. So you will see this formula there. Okay. So that's the story for, for torus knots and SLR uh, invariants. You have a question? Yeah. Is there any intuitive reason why it should be this limit of the ones that are multiples of R? I have no clue what why this is happening. I mean, that question you can ask for everything I've said in this, or I will say in this talk, and I really have no clue why this happens. That's interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So some interesting facts, right? I think, uh, anyway, so if you take, um, so let's take, uh, what's the first fact? Okay. So let's take P to be equal to R. So remember I started with SL2 and I took the torus knots two comma R. So let's do the same thing. SLR and R comma P prime. Okay. In this case, all of these shifted characters, they all coincide up to a sign, okay? So that's what you saw in SL2 case also, that if, if you took the limit along odds or evens, you got it up to a sign, and that, that happens uh, throughout, as long as you take P equal to R. So essentially, you get a unique limit, regardless of which coset you are going through. So that's what you saw for SL2 and torus knots T25, okay? Interesting facts too. Uh, so now, okay, by the way, if you switch P and P prime, then you don't change the torus knot. So how about we just fix the ordering P less than P prime. And now take your rank of, I mean, take the SLR, the R to be bigger than one of the parameters of your torus knot. In this case, okay, so if you know from, so basically I'm talking about a shifted level with one of the parameters being less than R, and that's not allowed, right? So if you took the character formula, nothing stops you from plugging in these values in the character formula, but that doesn't really correspond to the character of this W algebra at that level. So as a Q series, if you plugged in these values, then you will just get zero as, as the character, okay? And that can be proved very fairly easily with, uh, with some analysis of wild groups and all that. You just have to show that these terms cancel um, and you can prove that. So what does that mean? That means that the limit as n goes to infinity of this is zero, right? Uh, so why is that the case? Because what happens is that in this sum that's over while group and all this weights, there you can visibly see there is a huge cancellation in this sum. And instead of this whole weight set contributing, you only get contributions from, from its edge. And so the degree of the lowest term in this, in this invariant, it just keeps growing and growing. And so you get a zero as the limit. Okay, so if that's the case, then maybe what you should do is you should really consider in this case, the shifted invariance where you pull back that growing degree to be zero. Okay, so you divide by the trailing monomial so that you, you forcibly make those increasing degrees to start at zero. So if you do that, then conjecturally, um, what happens is that even though you're looking at SLR invariants, you end up still seeing the character of WP algebra. So it's strange. You're looking at SLR invariants, but because R is bigger than P, you end up getting WP P prime. Okay. And I only have some computational evidence for this conjecture. I don't, I don't really have much more than that, except that. I think this conjecture is true for r equal to three. So I'll, I'll just mention that. So one way to think about this conjecture is fix your knot P, P prime and keep increasing your SLR, keep increasing your R. Then as long as R is less than or equal to P, you will faithfully get the WR algebra. But once R becomes bigger than P, then sort of the world, it sort of stops at that point and you just get W, okay? 
And oh, one more thing. I, I really do mean here the limit n goes to infinity. I don't even need to take it over cosets. It looks like this, this limit in this case doesn't really care about that. No matter what coset you take, you, you just get the same limit. Okay, and this conjecture holds true for three, r equal to three, but it's fine. Okay. And uh, I guess it might be interesting to consider colored Homfle Homfle polynomials so that all of the SLRs can be treated at once. But I haven't really done that because my aim was to just connect it to known characters. But anyway. All right, so this is the story for torus knots and rational VOAs. Um, and what happens for non-rational VOAs? So mainly I have been able to show that the characters of singlet and triplet VOAs also come up. So what are these VOAs? So take Q to be an ADE root lattice and P be the corresponding weight lattice. And let's take small p to be something bigger than or equal to two. And then you have this diagram of VOAs. So you have this usual lattice VOA, you have the Heisenberg F sitting inside it. And this is a abelian intertwining algebra, which is coming from the, the lattice P and it's much bigger than what this VOA is. And you look at some screening operators coming from this much bigger generalized VOA and you act on, uh, act on this uh, friendly VOA and the kernel of those screening operators is your, uh, is this triplet algebra, I guess. If you just restrict the action to the, the Fox space of the Heisenberg, then you get the singlet algebra. And of course, uh, the Virasoro vector is shifted, so, so the, the central charge is something different from the usual lattice case. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so the designation singlet comes from, it's really an SL2 designation. It comes, I think, from one distinguished field in the singlet and three, which is the dimension of SL2, distinguished fields in triplet. So it really doesn't make sense to use these names for higher rank, I believe, but I'm still gonna use it. Um, okay, so as is usually the case in life, you know almost everything in SL2, but you don't know much about higher rank cases. I guess you do know, uh, you do know transformations of conjectured characters because there is a paper of Thomas and Anton, but even, knowing the simplicity of this high rank triplet was just done a couple of years ago by Sugimoto. So it's it really very little is known as, as much as I can tell you. But thankfully, we just need characters. I don't need any representation theory uh, at all. Okay, so what are the characters? So this is the character for the singlet and I'll, I'll just stick to SLR. And this is the character for the triplet. And you see it's uh, okay, uh, I'm taking this from the papers of Thomas and Anton and Anton and Catherine. And again, you won't see the formulas exactly in this uh, in this shape, but uh, in my paper, I, I just show a couple of lines of calculation where from their formulas, you can deduce these. Um, in any case, um, the prominent feature is, well, you know what this twist is. Any again, it's Q dimensions. Again, you know. Now, all that you see here in the singlet character is the is the zero weight space of this module, which is why you need lambda. I mean, okay, you don't need lambda to be in Q intersect P, but you're going to get non-trivial contribution only if lambda is a root, which is also a, a dominant weight. Otherwise the zero weight space is, is just zero. Anyway, and for the triplet, you just see the full dimension, right? So this looks a lot like that Rosso Jones formula you see all the three, there are three places, two ingredients are the same. The third ingredient is what you need to figure out. So, okay, so what is the Rosso Jones formula in this case for torus links? So I look at links that have, uh, that are of this shape, C comma CP. So it has C components and I'll again color with, uh, okay, so let me just tell you the general formula. I'll color with some irreducible module. And now instead of, uh, Plessism multiplicities, I'll need the tensor product multiplicity. So you look at the PS tensor product, P is coming from this P here, and you reevaluate that and write it in terms of irreducible modules. So these are the tensor product multiplicities. And there's a formula in the paper of uh, Lin and Jeng, which, show, which tells you that this is how it is, right? So all that I've done is instead of Plessism multiplicities, you now see tensor product multiplicities. And 
uh, they use slightly different framings and so on. So I've just ignored the pure power of Q that comes into play. Okay, so, and the point is we'll evaluate this formula when really the number of components is either R or R plus one. But in, in my paper, I also do the case where the number of components is less than R. But really the point is if you do R, then you see singlet and you do R plus one, you see the triplet. That's That's it. So all that you need to do is somehow connect these tensor product multiplicities to, well, let's look at the formula. You somehow have to connect the tensor product multiplicities to weight, zero weight space dimension, uh, rather dimension of the, the zero weight space and the full dimension of the module. This is a purely combinatorial problem now. And these are the two combinatorial facts. So if you take N lambda one, okay, you fix your weight mu. So you're taking RS, tensor product of the irreducible module with highest weight n lambda one. And you're asking how many times do I see the module with highest weight mu, right? So you just do that, but the, it turns out that it, as you take n going to infinity, you just see that this the number of times this mu shows up is exactly the zero is the, the, way, the dimension of the zeroth weight space. Okay, this theorem is not really a theorem. If you set up these things correctly, the proof is one line. You just have to know some facts about um, these, I guess, Littlewood Richardson coefficients and I, I guess the Peary rules or whatever it is called. And if you set things up correctly, this, this is really not a theorem. It's, it's a one line fact, okay? And it's even, if I remember correctly, this is even better than just limit. What happens is uh, if you take N to be too small, then mu doesn't even show up. So these things are zero, zero, zero. At some point, it just hits the dimension and then it stays there. So it, it's much simpler than what I'm saying here, but that's how I thought about I mean, that's how I like to think about it. And uh, there is a version of this theorem where if you take R plus first tensor powers, then you just get the dimension of the module. Now, the point is that R plus first tensor power, uh, you have to sort of make sure that mu even appears in this tensor decomposition or has a chance to appear in this tensor decomposition. So you see all these other things that n congruent to j and mu belongs to, they are just ensuring that the things are not just constantly zero, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> that's, that's what it is, right? Now, on the one hand, you saw that the formula for invariance involved the tensor product multiplicities. Formulas for characters involve these dimensions. And I'm going to take a limit anyway. So you just combine these facts, just make sure that the limit works out nicely. And, and that's what it is. If you take the R, RP, torus link, color it with this. So by what do I mean by coloring it with this? I have to color every component of that link with this. Then you'll see the character of singlet up to some factor. I do this with a link that has R plus one components, but now you have to take the limit along R dividing N, then you'll see the character of the triplet up to some factor. Assuming I have done everything correctly and so on. Okay, so some notes. So I, as I said, you can generalize this result to when the number of components is less than R. And your previous philosophy, I told you, right? Like if the, the rank is much bigger, than the parameters of your knot, then you actually end up getting character of that smaller rank VOA. So same thing happens. If you take C to be smaller than R, then you actually get SLC singlet characters, even though you're, in, you're evaluating SLR invariance. So this is again, something interesting. And for the triplet, if you take the limit more generally with N congruent to J mod R, then you just get some you get a character of some module, which I believe has to be a, sim a simple current of this VOA, but uh, I haven't checked that. Okay, um, so that's that's what it is. <laughs> now, <coughs> uh, you can ask, okay, these are just a very small sample of the links, and uh, I mean, there are so many links remaining. So the point is, there is a recent paper of Sugimoto and Hikami, they look at SL2 invariance, but for these torus knots where now R and S are co-prime, so 2R and 2S, not just 2 comma 2S, but 2R and 2S and 3R and 3S. And they tell you how the limits uh, connect to the characters of sing RS singlet and RS triplet. 
you don't see the characters of RS Singlet and RS Triplet immediately. There is something you have to do. Like there is some something you have to subtract. The limit involves something plus these characters. But anyway, you do see the characters coming up in these limits. Um, so that's what it is. All right, so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about, but let me just end with a few final thoughts. Okay, so beyond SL2, it is in general an open problem to find, not theoretically or otherwise, identities connected to the characters of these particular VOAs I'm talking about. So principal, W algebra, singlet, triplet. And in the SL2 case, you know, virus, I mean, SL2 case, this W algebra is the Virasoro. And in the 90s, there is a sequence of papers by many, many people who, who are just finding Rogers Ramanujan identities for Virasoro characters. And I think the culmination is a monograph by Trevor Welch, where he treats all the cases, all P's and all P primes for Virasoro. And there's a big, beautiful story there. In the SL2 case for the singlet, I believe you get false theta identities and you can look at the paper of Brinkman and Milas about what they are. And I guess uh, for triplet also, there is there are some papers, but I'm forgetting what they are right now. So SL2, we know a lot. SL3 and beyond, we, we know very little. For SL3, tri, uh, SL3 W algebra, 3 comma P, so not even all P, P prime, just 3 comma P, okay? Uh, <clears throat> there was a paper from 25 years ago, Andrew Schilling and Warner, who figured out the identities. Uh, but they didn't do all of the identities. So we conjectured them last year um, and we proved some of our conjectures, but really Warner has now proved all of these identities. Now, it's sometimes hard for people to, to understand how difficult the combinator X can be. So I just want to point out one fact, this paper of Andrew Schilling Warner, it appeared in jams. So this is really, this is difficult stuff. It's, I mean, you tell someone, okay, we figured out, or they figured out, okay, characters for W33P and the reaction will be, like, okay, so what? But it, it's not easy. Uh, this paper is is really not easy, okay? Uh, anyway, for the SL3 triplets and singlet, I guess I have some work in progress with Warner, but um, yeah, it, Anyway, it will take some time. And the methods are purely Q-series theoretic. It's, uh, we don't really see things from algebraic side yet. Okay, second, uh, there is much scope to generalize. You could you could change your knots, you could change your Lie algebra, you could change your weights. Uh, but I guess beyond the cases I've talked about, so SLR and the weights I considered, the combinatorics gets quite a bit more difficult. So I don't really know what happens. Or you could ask a different question. Okay, these are the VOAs you, you were able to obtain. Here is another VOA. Can, can you see that from, from not theory? And I, I don't know how to do that. The third thought is, what about modularity? So uh, we looked at torus knots, these invariants, and you got characters of principal W algebra, which is a rational VOA, strongly rational, in fact. So you have the best modular invariants that you can ask for. For these torus links, right? You saw triplet and conjecturally, this is for high ranks, this is a C2 cofinite. We know that for SL2, it is C2 cofinite by Adamovich and Milos, but conjecturally it is C2 cofinite. So you have some sort of modularity, but then for the singlets, this is a highly non-rational VOA, right? So so what, what really is go uh, going on? Like, can you predict when, when you get some modularity properties or what? I mean, what's the pattern here? By the way, there are a lot of papers now with Anton and Catherine and their collaborators who are who are looking at these uh, characters of singlets and some some fancy things like quantum modular forms and all that. So this is very much on the edge of what people are doing right now. And that's it. Thank you so much, Shashank, for the wonderful talk. Let me start stop the recording so that we can get ready for questions.